Is that your is that dog or cat? Okay. Good morning, or good afternoon. Sorry, I said good morning. <laughs> That's all right. I do know. I yeah. think I tell people shake hands, say good morning, good afternoon. So. Yeah, people are used to seeing me in the in the in the morning, so <laughs> on Sunday morning. So they'll say whenever they see me, they'll say good so morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good faster. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it is. Yeah. I remind them of a sunny morning, and that oh, I'm reflecting the love of the sun. So <laughs> good morning, it's good for me. You know, that's right. Um, well, welcome everyone. Good evening, and hello, Linda. How, how are you? I'm finally uh, negative for COVID. <laughs> okay. Finally. Praise God. Praise God. Yes. We will we'll look forward to seeing you again. Um, I know that it, it's it, unfortunately it seems like these numbers are increasing and more people are getting it, even if it is more mild than it was, was or milder than it was before. It's it's still out there. Yeah, I'm glad to be be better, but I'm still coughing. So maybe All by right. next Wednesday. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll pray for you. And, Thank you. Um, just talk to Rod Techhart. Okay, now you can. I'm test. I think my microphone was muted for whatever reason. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Great. So Rod and Nancy Peckhart, uh, their their dog passed away um, from heart failure uh, today. So very hard day for them. Yeah. So we'll be praying for them. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll obviously also close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening. The rain gives life to the earth. And it is like the mystery of life itself, Lord. There's times where it scares us and fear for it. And uh, your power is awesome and mighty. But we place our trust in you. And just as we come to the shelter of this chapel, we seek to dwell in the shelter of your wing, your, the presence of your spirit to guide us in this words of scripture that you've given through the prophets of the ages, O oh God, and through the apostles. May these words guide us and lift us up, encourage us. And may we find comfort in this evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in chapter two of the Gospel of Mark. So we're, we're going to go through the chapter two. And um, let's see here. Sure. All right. When you have like multiple screens or monitoring things. Uh... Hello, Richard. Welcome. Yes, David. We talked a little bit last week about Mark being the oldest gospel. Even though Matthew's gospel comes first in the New Testament, Mark's gospel um, 
according to many modern scholars, comes first. I mean, this isn't by no means 100% is everybody on board with this, but yeah. most of the scholars nowadays uh, view Mark as the first, and it, this is a theory known as Markin priority. So that's a fancy way of saying Mark came first. Um, because many had thought one point that Matthew would come first, but we talked a little bit about last week about how Mark does not have the birth narrative in it, and neither does John's gospel. But both Mark and John's gospel are linked in that the baptism begins the beginning. So the nativity is not the essence, it's the baptism. And the, the reason those two kind of give that sign and indication is it's where does our journey begin with Jesus? You know, our journey begins with Jesus when we, you know, come to faith, when we're baptized and our parents are raising us or when we make it on our own uh, and make that decision and become baptized ourselves. So it's written from the perspective of the, the believer journeying with Jesus in both Mark and John. So that's something that they share in common. And Mark, along with Matthew and Luke, share similar perspectives on certain miracles and events in Jesus' ministry. And so in, in contrast with John's gospel, John shares some unique perspectives that are not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. So the similarity between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, people call them the synoptic gospels, which is a fancy word in Greek that means with the same eye. So they have a similar perspective on Jesus. And Mark's gospel, if unique from all the other four, focuses a lot on Jesus' healing ministry. There's a tremendous urgency to it. It moves fairly rapidly, the gospel of Mark. And as I shared with the class last week, uh, John Mark was involved in a dispute between Paul and Barnabas. It was John Mark who was traveling with Paul and Barnabas on Paul's first missionary journey, and halfway through, he says, I'm done, I'm, I'm, I'm not going anymore. And uh, then he wants to re come back into the fold, and Barnabas wants to welcome back, and then Paul says, no, no, no. And then that's where Paul and Barnabas have their separation based on John Mark. So John Mark may have had some input from Barnabas, from Paul, and Tradition says that he made his way to Rome and also had shared in Peter's eyewitness. So Mark may very well share a lot of Peter's eyewitness of what Jesus, Jesus ministry, you know. So that that's that's at least the tradition that's been handed down to us. It's hard to, you know, get through all those layers. But what we need to know, we know through um, through scripture that we're going to read and um <clears throat> there's always more about jesus that we would have liked to know, have known i mean what color was his hair uh how tall was he what other miracles he did that what other yeah, miracles 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 right right all, all yeah. these other things he did which i didn't write here right and john's gospel says that and even luke's gospel tells us in the beginning um, that this is no, by no means is this exhaustive of what Jesus did. So, hi, and we, and welcome, uh, mother. How are you doing? My mother joined us on Zoom, so she, you'll hear her from time to time. So, you got a good group here this evening. Uh, Linda and Karen Abel. I shouldn't say it, Karen. You don't call your mother by. Have you all ever? Did you all ever call your mother by her first name? No, exactly. So rarely, rarely do I. Yeah, you don't care, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, I'm not on camera anymore. What happened here? All right. Camera is free.
Okay, can you hear me now? Can you see me? I lo I, I'm sorry. You won't be able to see the those online, see the folks that are with us or see, um, hear them as well because I have, I lost my um, meeting owl connection. So I'll test it out, but usually it's not an issue. All right, so let's go to chapter two. I've given enough of an introduction here. Um, I'll show you on this map here, which I'm gonna pass around if you just got here. Uh, this shows the Galilee where Jesus ministered and Capernaum is right over here. And that is on the Western side of the Sea of Galilee. So you can take a look there and it kind of shares a little bit about that, but that was the headquarters for Jesus ministry. He didn't really stay settled with the disciples, but it is where Peter and the other disciples lived. And our, they've actually found Peter's house in Capernaum. In addition to unearthing the synagogue, just a few, like maybe a block away, there's the house of Peter. And they actually have built a church on top of it. So if you ever are able to take a Holy Land tour, it, uh, you, it's just a remarkable thing to see. Oh, wow, this is some, a place where Jesus did his miracles, where he taught the disciples. And just a few miles away, you can go to the fishing village, what would have been the fishing village of Bethsaida, um, which means house of the fishermen. And it was a small fishing village. So they, they would cast, you know, they would push out their boat, like in a boat ramp in Bethsaida, even though Capernaum was near the Sea of Galilee, it was easier for them to go downstream and then come in where it was less rough. Um, and there was more water that flowed into Bethsaida. Now, if you go to Bethsaida in the Holy Land, you don't see much water around it. So you're, so you're like, how could these disciples have gone? But just know that water levels rise and fall and streams change. And of course, in modern Israel, they have put a bunch of canals and dams around the Jordan River to, you know, for irrigation, for sewage, for water. So it's changed the water level from what it was in Jesus' time. Um, <clears throat> when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it's reported that he was at home. See, I'm saying this is home base for Jesus. Hello? Hello. Hi, David. Can you hear us? Yes, I'm good. Thank you. Now, I think we're having trouble because of the lightning. That's what I think some of it is. Um, he turned to Capernaum after some days. It was reported that he was home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in the front of the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after they were having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves, and he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take up your mat and walk, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. He stood up immediately, took the mat, and went out before all of them. So they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Amen. So, what are your thoughts about this particular miracle? I recently saw a video dramatization of this whole scenario, and it was very impressive and really brought 
tears to the eyes. Very moving. Mm. Oh, I, th I think the name of the series is called The Chosen. The Chosen, yes. Mm -hmm. Very, it's a very good show. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, well, I think it was last year or right when I first came, we did a, we did a series on The Chosen. So we mm -hmm. actually had some of the clips shown in church. Oh, yeah. Cool. But now you've got, I think they're, they had, that was the first season. Now they've got a second season. And I think they even have started a third season. I, I, I wouldn't know, but yeah, it's a great show. Well, they must have had a lot of either confidence mm -hmm. or nerve uh, to do that, to break through the roof of somebody's house mm -hmm. and lower them down. It was just like, how are you going to do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they might have been just removing the sun cover. Yeah, the thatched, the, it, it was a thatched roof, probably. Not like, you yeah, know, not like Europe. Through this. No, but it, yeah, it would have been like removing a thatch or some parts of sticks or tile. Not tile, but like, yeah, just laid in sections. Yeah. So, uh, but easier to lift up, not like taking the axe and smashing, you know, through one of our roofs. Or easier to replace. Easier to replace, but nonetheless audacious. Mm. And yeah. <laughs> well, I, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people feel like it was at Peter's home where this miracle was done. And it was pretty cool, the church that in the Holy Land that's built on, um, there, they built it on top of Peter's house where they did the dig and they uncovered Peter's house. And so you're in the church, you've got the glass bottom floor where you're looking down mm. like this, um, like these fellows who lowered their friend down the roof. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he shows authority that doesn't come from anywhere else but God. I mean, there who can forgive sins but God? And he's for, he's forgiving sins. Teachers, um, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, he was claiming authority that would only be from heaven. And so there's that's blasphemy, you know, when you claim your God or speak against God, this is, this, and it's this, something that could be punishable by death. But almost at the beginning of his ministry, he's getting himself in hot water. Yeah, so there's a boldness on the part of people who have faith, who want to bring Jesus to them, and there's a boldness on Jesus' part. And so that it kind of says that the you know, our relationship in a way is a lot like that. You know, the, 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 you know, God's grace so audacious to reach down into earth where we're all sinful and we're whole, all, all together different than what God is. God is holy and yet he brings his down to come and get us. And the faith of the, the others coming to, to Jesus with desperation reaching out to um, God or, or this person, Jesus, for healing. So it kind of shows how God and human beings meet. You know, there's a sincerity and faith 
and there's a, a sincere desire for God to see his children helped and healed uh, through Jesus. So it's pretty, pretty neat. It sets uh, the pattern for Jesus' ministry. I, it was interesting, uh, several months ago, Pastor Gary shared this testimony about, you know, how coming through the, the second transplant, he talked about this parable, saying you have been those friends, like the one who's lowered the friends through the roof. Uh, in, in other words, what he was saying was that this is also an image of intercession. When you want to pray for your friends, you're doing that. You're doing something similar before them. You know, in the throne room of God, you're taking, you, you know, your friend who you love or your family member, and you're saying, here, Jesus, please take care of them. You know, and that's what faith does. Faith bring, brings, um, it, in prayer, brings somebody you care about or the concerns of the world before God. You're right into the presence of God. It's kind of like Commissioner Gordon calling up uh, Batman. <laughs> I mean, it's more than that, but I remember uh, I would watch reruns of the, the Batman show, you know, from the 60s, um, and they'd have that red phone, <laughs> and Commissioner Gordon had him called Batman, and I just thought that was cool, because that's that's the image of what prayer is. We have, you know, we can get that phone and contact God. You know? I, I, there's been a few uh, church signs that have said, um, some of you use email, but how many of you ever use email? Email, you know, get on your knees and pray. Or that, um, the other one I heard, have you ever heard this one, that Mo Moses was the first one to download um, something on the tab through, download something on the tablets through the cloud. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, you got the Ten Commandments. He's downloading them, you know, through the, through the cloud. <laughs> yeah, something like that. So, well, uh, we continue right along, move rapidly from the physical healing now to spiritual healing that occurs, the salvation that occurs. Jesus is showing himself as Savior in more Excuse ways me, than David, one. David, you are assuming Jesus I know what the cloud is. Matthew, Levi. David. Jesus went out again beside the sea. The whole crowd gathered around him David. and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to them, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. And he sat at dinner in Levi's house, uh, Levi's house, or Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there are many who followed him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to the disciples, why do you, does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. In our, in the communion liturgy in the United Methodist Church, we have a more formal communion liturgy. Uh, one of the uh, sort of orders of that has a portion where it's called the Great Thanksgiving, where it kind of you reenact or you remember what Jesus had done all through his ministry. And one of the things it emphasizes in that liturgy is how Jesus ate with sinners. And why do you think that they wanted to do that in the communion liturgy? He ate with sinners and then bring it into communion where we're eating with Jesus. What is it trying to say about to us or about us when we come in the presence of God? We're all sinners. Yeah. That's right. You, you're not coming to this meal because, you know, you're particularly worthy or exceptional. Rather, rather one who's exceptional has made an exception for you. And, you know, come on. All you are weary. You know, I will give you rest. You know, there's something that Jesus is saving us from. We need Jesus. All of us need Jesus. Every single one of us. Some of us might think, well, they need Jesus more than I do, but that's not true. At the baseline level, all of us need Jesus equally. And so it's an important reminder 
you know, he ate with sinners. So we might look at somebody and say, you know, that person, I'm glad I'm not that person. At least I'm not there. I'm better off. But, you know, we need the humility. And that's why something like that reminds us. And particularly this verse always reminds me, he ate with, he ate with sinners. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, or, yeah. Library for saints, or I've heard it's not a rest home for saints, it's a hospital for sinners. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> now, just so you get an idea about tax collectors in Jesus' day, they were not reputable people. David. Probably, probably heard me say this before, but it would kind of like be a mafia boss or you know, running a racket. You know, basically, they were part of an organized crime syndicate in the Roman Empire, extorting people for tax money that they barely had or didn't have. It didn't matter if people could barely eat. You know? And part of the problem with this is they would add things on the top for their own gain. You know, it wasn't as if tax collecting, they, you know, had the same kind of rules and regulations and books and monitoring and auditing that we have now. So they were gaining a lot from it. If you had a tax collect, you know, if you were a tax collector, it was a, you know, a lucrative career, but everybody hated you and everybody looked down on you, you know? So it didn't matter if you had a lot of money, you were the scum of the earth, you know? So that's why I kind of usually compare it a little bit to like organized crime. You know, those guys have a lot of money, but that doesn't mean that they have a good reputation at all, you know? Um. <clears throat> Matthew was a tax collector. And he's also, he, his name is uh, um, Levi. Mm-hmm. Mm. So this is Matthew also. This is Matthew called Levi. Levi. Hmm. So many of them have two different uh, different names, you know, uh, for a variety of reasons. Some of them were Greek names, and some of them were, uh, you know, nicknames or family names. It, it just depended. We don't know the full extent, but like Simon Peter, uh, you know. We don't know if it was a nickname, Peter was a nickname, or if it was, a, in fact, another name. But there's a whole lot of people who have several different the disciples who have several different names, and it gets commu- confusing. Like, for example, um, for our, Philip is also Nathaniel, I think, or no, wait, um, Bar- one of them, maybe it's Bartholomew is also. Philip and then Nathaniel. Anyhow, I get them all confused, but they, yeah, you can tell I'm struggling, you know. But the the idea is you have to almost get a Bible dictionary to figure out the 12 disciples because in one gospel they're called a different name. They're the same people. And, you know, it's kind of been carried down through tradition and letters and understanding that, yeah, they were the same people. Even, for instance, Saul, who was Paul, it's not as if on the road to Damascus, um, Saul, for the first time, became Paul and just said, now you're going to call me Paul. It was likely already somewhat of a name that was being used in a Roman context. The Saul, Jewish name, Paul, a Roman name. And he was going, you know, he was, would go back and forth between those two worlds. So... I know several immigrants who, especially like from China, where they will come to the U.S. and they will just like adopt an Americanized or English name because they just get tired of people mispronouncing their names. They're like, just call me Ashley, you know, or something else, which because people are, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, when I was in, learning Arab, the Arabic language, they gave all of us in the, in the class in um, Arab name. Yusuf. 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 
uh, Y-U-S-I-F. Yusuf. And that was actually, the, that's the equivalent of Joseph. Yeah. Like in Hebrew, it's Yosef. And, and in uh, Arabic, it's Yusuf. So. No, no, it's a good name, Joseph. Yeah. So, um, but yes. <clears throat> now, the question about fasting. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. This is in verse 18. And people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, the wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come from when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it. The new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost. And so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. What are, what are some thoughts on what you're reading here? That verse is always been confusing to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So what? So what would be confusing? Um, the fact that it's logical that you wouldn't put new wine in old wines. Why does he have to emphasize it? So a couple things here. I think you're you're seeing it's a bridge between the his response that he's eating with sinners, and now he's got not only the Pharisees on one side, but then you've got John's disciples, people who were following John the Baptist, who were looking at Jesus and saying, But you're not having the same vow as John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist may have had some type of Nazarite vow where he abstained from alcohol. And this, we talked a little bit about this last week, how this vow is similar to the one that Samson made. Mm -hmm. So it may have been something that John did as an adult or very early in his life. He was, you know, his mother kind of committed him to that. I think it's more than likely that he took that vow himself. And he, some have said that he may have been influenced by a community of people who were in the desert region who were fleeing the temple, the sinfulness of the city, and going into the wilderness to seek God and true worship of God. And those were called the Essenes. And it is from that community of these people, Essenes, which you can actually read about in Josephus, who is a Roman historian who was Jewish, and gives us a wonderful record of things that happened in the Bible outside of that. So it, you can anchor what's happening in the New Testament in Jesus' ministry in two writers, primarily Jewish writers. One's called, named Josephus, and one is named Philo. And in Josephus, they talk about the Essenes. They talk, he talks about them going into the wilderness and seeking to escape the sinfulness of the city and the desecration of the temple. Um, and they start, so John may have very well, one theory is he may have well been influenced by this community of Essenes who were seeking um, purity in their life, you know, abstaining from alcohol, a lot of fasting. And here's Jesus, who's not, even though he's received John's baptism, he is not taking the same vow. Uh, you know, partly is, I think is, is there's a different nature of the mission. The mission for John is to seek purity, to, you know, sort of religious escapism and it is there that Jesus kind of finds his way in the wilderness but then he Jesus knows that he's got to come back from the wilderness place into the place where people are where the masses are and minister to them so in order to minister to the masses 
you know, you've got to get to know them. And if, if you have to eat with them and talk with them and relate to them. You know, um, in, Whereas John didn't do it. John didn't do that, right. Yes, he, he, his was come to me. And a lot of people came to him because they heard, oh, this is a place that I can go to seek refuge and go to the Jordan River, renew my life, renew spiritually. But it, I think it's always that pattern of our spiritual life. You know, there are times where we have to engage with people and there are times we have to draw back and be quiet and, and center ourselves in prayer. And it shows in Jesus' ministry, he did that. We're going to see time where he draws away and, he, and they come to him, but there are also times where he's going to come to people into their home, into their house, eat with them, dine with them. You know, it's, so I think it says to us that sometimes being in ministry and sharing Jesus is going to require us to go outside of our comfort zone if we follow the pattern of Jesus. So can you all think of an example where you were outside your comfort zone and sharing Jesus with someone? Okay, that's a great example, Dennis. I can't hear what he's saying, David. David, could you repeat what he's saying? Kairos is a prison ministry where they take uh, a retreat and they operate the retreat from lay servants and, and spiritual leaders in the prison. So different pastors from different denominations and different churches or in, in lay leaders that would come in and lead these retreats. And they're usually for like three days. And it's the idea is three days, you're supposed to encounter the risen Christ after three days. And uh, it's a wonderful program. But yes, it will definitely take you out of your comfort zone to be um, behind bars. Like, I want to get out now. <laughs> and you, but at the same time, you understand oh, there's a need here. And I think at times when, I think, let's see here, what's the signal? Something about the signal. Uh, so reminder that they can't hear you all. So I will try to repeat your responses to them. And then hopefully this microphone gets fixed next week. Um, being in the military is a similar one. When I go on the National Guard Week and I put on the uniform and I have to step out of the comfort zone of leading worship in the sanctuary and find a corner of the drill hall or in the middle of a, you know, a rifle range or field, you know, go offside to the bleachers and arrange and say, all right, everybody, 10 minutes, if you'd like to come to a chapel service, I'm going to do communion. And you, and you, you have about 10 minutes to do a field service, you know, and you set it, you actually have a little kit as a chaplain that you set it up. And one of the interesting things uh, about the chaplain kit is they actually give you a cross. If you're a Christian, they give you a cross and one side of the cross has the crucifix on it, and the other side has um, the Greek letters uh, the, in Jesus Christ Savior. You know, Jesus Christos Soterios, in mm -hmm. Jesus Christ Savior. So one is a pro more Protestant, and one's more Catholic or Orthodox. So you, depending on what you are or what you're doing, you can flip the cross around to adapt. And your communion kit. Yeah, you just do what you got to do to step out your comfort zone to share Christ with people. And so you could see that we follow that example of Jesus when we go into places. And I think a place that some people are challenged to visit and minister to, but is so needed, are um, nursing homes. And that's one of the things that I really have felt a heart for since the COVID pandemic is, you know, when they shut everything down and People couldn't go and see their relatives and their loved ones. It had devastating effect. How lonely they were. How lonely maybe some of you were not being able to connect with relatives and loved ones. Um, and so I think to recover that kind of ministry, there's a, such a need. I, I heard they were saying at the hospital, um, they need volunteers at Waterman <laughs> Hospital, you know. 
I, we put that in the bulletin in church, but sometimes that can be out of our comfort zone. People are, have relatives in there, they're hurting, they're crying, and it's not comfortable, but that's where God sometimes needs us to be, you know, I step out of our comfort zone. When it comes to those who mind right, that was the other part Marty was asking. Yeah, I didn't get to that. Yeah. So how does that relate to Jesus is setting a new pattern for ministry, a pattern that's different than the Pharisees and different than John. The pattern that Jesus, the Pharisees set was a pattern of um, strict adherence to the, the Torah. And the pattern that, that John was setting was you know, sort of an uh, aesthetic, or not aesthetic, but... Um, when you ascetic, you know, you walk in the world, you starve yourself, you go into the wilderness. And these are all oval forms where Jesus' form of ministry is incarnational, meeting people where they are. God is meeting people where they are. Where once when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, he had to boot them out. Now, because of Jesus, God is once again coming into the world. And this time he's coming right into the middle, outside of the garden, into the simple world in the world, but not of the world. And this is a new pattern of ministry. You know, no longer is, is it, this person is pure, this person is unpure because the pure spotless lamb comes into the world and said, this is a new opportunity that God is giving to come and meet everyone where they are. And this is not just going to be for the chosen people. This is going to be for all the people of the world. So I think that's what Jesus is saying is that um, you don't, take a new message and use the same old methods for that message. If you've got a new um, you know, message, you may have to require a new method to, yeah. That's yeah. somewhat what Max is saying too, is that you can't put a new life product into an old, or a new life into an old life product. Yes, yes, yeah. It's gonna, it does require change. I mean, when people, a lot of people struggle sometimes when they, you know, first become a Christian and they lose friends that they had before because they can't relate to them. Like they, maybe some of their friends, they were always hanging out at the bar. And, you know, that doesn't mean to say you have to abandon your friends, but if you had a problem with drinking, you're not, and you want to change your life and give it to Christ, it may require you, okay, I can't just go back to where I was, I have to go somewhere else because God's asking me to be somebody new. That, that's an instance in our personal life. And then um, in the church life, it requires not just a worship in the temple, but it also requires, you know, worship in the, in the synagogue, going out to different cities. Paul's missionary journeys are a perfect illustration, a to totally new way of God calling people to share the message, you know, not just staying on the mountaintop to receive it on the mountaintop, but to go down into the valley and meet people where they are. But, so I think some of it is not just our own lives changing, which is part of it, but also a whole society changing because we are changing our methods to share Christ to a hurting world. Um, Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. That's another challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I think that we could easily read this in terms of conversion, and I think there are other passages that address that, but I, my interpretation take on it is not as much of that as abandoning old friends as it is new means and new ways of, of doing ministry, but I could see 
how that in, in, in your Bible, life application Bible, it's applied that way. So I don't think it means to abandon your friends, but certainly in your own spiritual life, um, you're going to pour, fill your, sustain yourself with different things than, you know, food, alcohol, you know, sexual gratification, whatever it might be. And it's going to be a little bit different. You're filling your life with prayer, uh, fasting, you know, practices that sustain you. And in order to do that, you're, you know, your body's a temple. So it's going to, you're going to treat it differently than you did before. So that some of that is, is probably part of it, but um, Jesus is, is really coming down on the Pharisees. I think that's part of it. And the Sadducees is saying some, some, yeah, I think it's more about ch preaching to Judaism at that time that you're going to have to change this, this temple, this way, this tent cult of the temple and the way you've been worshiping and the way you've been focusing on, this is all going to change. And in some ways it's a prophecy. It's a statement of Jesus talking about his own ministry. I am doing new things because I have a new message. This is a new covenant. And the new covenant is going to be poured into new people that are different than the old people. So it might even be referring to the Gentiles to some extent. So, But I can see the usefulness of applying it for personal application in our modern world. I just don't, for this passage, I don't see it as much like I, if we were talking about a golf passage in John where it said, be in the world, but not of the world, that I feel is more applicable to what you're talking about where, you know, but I always try to, when I read scripture, I tend to try to say, what is surrounding the scripture that gives me a clue to the context of what it's saying? And when it's Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and they're questioning him about his eating with sinners pretty hard to say oh you got to abandon your old lifestyle it's more about abandoning an old way of religion to be honest is what he's saying to them about you know there, there's something that needs to change about the way that people are worshiping god and so he's talking in this instance more to the religious than the non-religious um and in, in his time um and um yeah and, Teachers, the scribes, Pharisees, they all had religion, but we're looking at it all, all through the, uh, the sort of rules. Of the yes. Of, so that's what they had in their hearts. It's just, they were always trying to catch them. Just, um, some, some fact that they had religion in their hearts, but they didn't have Jesus in their hearts. Yeah, they had ritual. And they had religion, but they didn't have the relationship with God. And in order to have that new relationship, um, the and it's also a sense that Jesus is saying that a lot of you aren't going to get this because you're into old habits and old wineskins. So the image of new of new wine is wine that's not yet fully fermented. So in the fermentation process it will create air and it will expand and old wine skins, uh, you know, don't have as much elasticity. They've already been stretched out. So if they're stretched out more, uh, they will explode <laughs> and burst. Um, and it, it, what Jesus is saying is there's going to be some who are going to receive this and not be able to handle it. <laughs> it's going to explode burst on them. The air is going to expand you know, not going to be able to handle this. So he's kind of taking a remark of the Pharisee. Some of you, he's saying, some of you are not going to get what I'm saying. And you're not going to be ready for it because you're stuck in the old ways. And if you're stuck in the old ways, you're going to um, pop and burst. And you're not going to be able to handle what I'm, what I'm doing. So you're going to, so in some ways, it's also, I think, a missionary example of having to adapt um, I think the church struggles with this in, in, in this day and age. Uh, you know, churches will sometimes have battles over worship styles. And what's better, contemporary or, uh, or traditional worship? And, you know, and, and churches have struggled with this. And when some of the people have said, what is going to be the best way to reach new people and new places and new ways for Christ? And it may not be having a pipe organ to be honest, 
you know, um, as I was sharing on Sunday a little bit about some churches that I've seen and even my own experiencing ministering with, to folks who live on the street or who are unhoused you, or even in the military, it requires a different type of ministry. I've got to have to adapt and I've got to just take my chapel kit out and be okay with having four or five people take communion. And that would be meaningful what God wanted me to do instead of just thinking, go in on Sunday morning, you know, have an ad in the paper and hope that two or 300 people come to worship and you preach to them for 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes. When I do the chapel service in the military, it requires five minutes message, five minute communion, pray, and then, you know, but that is just as meaningful as that. So it's an example to me of where I think Jesus is saying, go to step outside your comfort zone. You got to do something a little bit different. Um, and it's going to require that the Holy Spirit's going to probably pour new uh, gifts into you and new ministry. But in order to receive that, you've got to change your own ways and your own comfort in doing things. Yeah. Yeah. So some have said, some have interpreted this as changing lifestyle. We talked about that. I gave you my emphasis on changing the religion into a relationship. And then there's another interpretation of looking at the, you know, receiving the Holy Spirit and trusting in God's gifting to you to do ministry. Because you might, you can do ministry that I can't, and I can do ministry you can't, but there's somebody, there's a sphere of influence that e each of us have that's unique that uh, God has given us. And um, we just have to open our eyes to it. Um, yeah. So. But I, I do, I'm not saying in your Debbie and your Bible that he's wrong. I'm just saying I, I look at it a little different. exactly exactly yeah but i i can't i i don't know have a good question for um how do you do that if you've had a conversion you've changed your lifestyle i, I think a lot of times what happens is it isn't, isn't you that's trying to leave your friends as much as it is your friends will kind of you'll find out who your true friends are <laughs> yeah you Sometimes that's really what most often happens is you become more of a Christian and if you can stay strong, yeah. And there might be that pull because you want to fit in. But a lot of times what happens is your friends are like, uh, they weren't that close as friends as you thought they were. <laughs> um. So when you talked about why you do it, you know, the what? The bridegroom. The bridegroom, uh-huh, right. Uh, yeah the bridegroom the he's saying he's describing this is a feast you know this isn't a time for fasting this is a time for feasting the bridegroom is among you this is a time for celebration i'm here the, the, yeah yes yes to god's people that there's somebody who's come to to be the kinsman redeemer. You know, there's a, a thought of when you read Ruth, the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, for example, you know, Ruth refers to Boaz as my kinsman redeemer. And in many ways, that's a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, the kinsman redeemer, not just of one person, but of all of humankind that's bringing, you know, people into a right relationship with God because Ruth was brought into a right relationship through Naomi and invitation and then through Boaz. So in a bigger level, Jesus is that kinsman redeemer like Boaz for the whole world. And so Jesus is kind of saying that um, this is time to celebrate because I'm here. There's going to be a time I'm not going to be here. And when I'm not here, the party's over, <laughs> you know, yeah, so these pe these folks don't realize how good they have with Jesus around. I think every single one of us in this room would have loved to be there with Jesus, you know, as he was doing his ministry. Because we know what they didn't know, of course. 
And that's what he's kind of giving a hint at. You're gonna re you're gonna regret this. I'm gone, and I so that's why I think this sticks in their memory uh, so much. You know, for like Peter to have heard this from Jesus, and probably at the time thinking nothing of it, and then looking back and saying, "Yeah, he was really right. We should have had time to celebrate when we had the chance." Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I also think that Jesus um, is also, you know, it kind of reminds me of Ecclesiastes. Um, Jesus is teaching as a rabbi was in that tradition of the wisdom literature, like Ecclesiastes, like the Proverbs. And uh, it said, you know, and you think about the famous passage from Ecclesiastes chapter three, it says, there's a time to be born. There's a time to die. So Jesus is kind of saying, "There's a time to, there's a time to fast, but now is more appropriate the time to feast. So let's feast, and then I'll tell you when we need to fast. <laughs> you know, trust me. You know, there's a balance. You don't just stay like John out in the wilderness all the time and and fast and starve yourself, and you don't, you know, just." you know, be gluttonous and feast all the time, you you have a balance. There's feast and fast. And, and in the spiritual life, there's a time to mourn and cry, and then there's a time to celebrate and dance. Um, so the other interesting image he offers here other than the bridegroom is no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it. the new from the old. A worse tear is made. Um, so there will, Jesus, I think you're also referring to conflict that will occur, that um, this, you can't just compromise sometimes with the, the old and the new. Sometimes you're going to have to take this new covenant and trust in it. More, maybe more a message for them, but there's certainly, um, you know, a lesson here for us, I think, that uh, if you have your new life in Christ, there may be some as Debbie said, some relationships that are best not engaged in anymore um, because they will create a rift anyway. And the rift will be even bigger than it was before. So. Well, uh, let's continue. Uh, there's one last passage to cover here in 23 uh, to 28. And one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And in some ways, this is uh, what's, caused, uh, what's called a, um, in the biblical structure, they used Greek terms for these were rhetorical devices that speakers would use. Uh, rhetoric was taught to all over the ancient world. And so you even see that same principles of rhetoric and making a point in the writing of the gospel. So you, the, the events of the gospel are not always in chronological order, at least from what we can tell, because that's why in some gospels they're in different orders. The order that's more important is thematic order. Yes, it probably occurred sometime early in Jesus' ministry, as best as we can tell, but you can see it's in thematic order because there's a point here. This makes sense um, when it's, it's a collage that Mark puts together for us to see who Jesus really is. At the beginning, he's healing a paralytic, and they say, who can forgive sin? Now get up and walk. And then now he says the son of man is even Lord of the Sabbath. So he's tying himself to not only the forgiveness of sins, but to the Sabbath itself, which is God's holy day. You know, he has authority 
over the Sabbath. So this is, you know, at the beginning, it's authority, and at the end, it's authority, and it's establishing its authority, and all that's coming in between. Um, these are bookends that give us a key to understand all that's gone on in the middle of the chapter. And a lot of times you will see that in these chapters in the Bible is that there is a um, there is a beginning that kind of is similar and an ending part in this episode. And so they tie it together. So the bookend at the beginning is a question, the Pharisees questioning his authority and the bookend at the end of this chapter, what, uh, what is it? Pharisees he's question his authority. Yeah, he's presenting his authority. So a question of authority, a question of authority, a question of forgiving sins and a question of um, the Sabbath. What, what's reasonable to happen on the Sabbath. Um, and it's also a reoccurrence of a theme that came back from the first chapter because we, uh, or no, not the first, no, I don't think we talked about that in the first chapter. But anyhow, the authority question and the authority question, um, as I said, that's why these are things that we don't really know about, but in the ancient world, they would have understood them because there was a certain way to, to tell a story like we, we tell a story once upon a time in a certain pattern, you expect a certain pattern of a fairy tale. Well, in telling a story in a gospel story, you would expect a certain pattern of establishing the theme in each chapter. So, so just watch for that in each of the chapters, how it begins in the chapter, how it ends, and see if it relates to the other things in, in the middle. And that will give you kind of a key of what to look for in the middle. Now that you know it's a question about authority, then you, it makes sense why he's talking about you should celebrate while the groom is here among you. It makes more sense about, okay, what is this wine skin and what is this wine thing? It is about something to do with a new renewed relationship with God, something to do with authority. It's a new covenant. So that's why I'm saying that the Bible itself, sometimes we're apt to pull out things from the Bible, from their context, when some of the best ways to interpret them are within the context of the Bible itself. You know, um, That's one of the things I was taught in seminary was, you can get a whole lot, uh, you can spend a whole lot of money getting a whole lot of resources to study things, uh, you know, to get, to try to make sense of the Bible and get other commentaries when maybe if you slow down and take a look at the structure of how it's written, the structure will sometimes tell you, will sometimes answer your questions that you were having anyway. You know, like, what does this new wine and wineskins mean? Hmm. Is it the beginning? It talks about authority of this chapter, the end. Yes, that's what it does. And it requires that you, you sometimes slow down. And it sometimes even requires, sometimes you, color, you, you have a pen to color code uh, things, you know? Yeah, and, and yeah, I mean, you're going through a Bible course of study right now, Melba, right? Inductive Bible study, that's what I'm talking about, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. So Melba, for those of you online, is talking about she's taking a course in inductive, inductive Bible study. And that's similar to what I was taught in seminary about using color pencils and coding to under, identify the structure of the passage, to think about it a little bit before you are so quick to jump to another commentary or a resource. You know, it's kind of like, a, you know, it may give you clues to un, unlock the meaning for yourself if you take time to meditate on it and slow down a little bit and read it. Mm. Is there such a thing, a rainbow Bible? Oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah. Yes, yeah, color. The Rainbow Bible, I'd love to see that, but yeah, that's the that's the exact idea as it takes to yeah. Yeah, okay, that's a great example for doing, yeah, for unlocking the scripture, you know, seeing different themes. 
you know, it's kind of like what you were taught in middle school or high school English. A lot of that can help with understanding scripture. It's um, the way the gospels are written. These people, the gospel writers were very gifted. The evangelists were very gifted people. You know, that's why they were the ones that God tapped on the shoulder. All right, write these stories about Jesus. And they did it in a, a neat structure that we sometimes overlook and don't appreciate. Uh, you know, yeah. So. Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Before you can do your healing ministry. Fantastic. Um, so let's talk about this as we close this, this passage. The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This is, this is interesting to unlock. So that, um, as I said, God is reaching down to human beings, offering them a gift. This is a, you know, a clue to read into God's grace. Uh, compare this to, uh, I'm not, Jesus he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have come to not call the righteous, but sinners. So in other words, God is coming to meet us where we are uh, to heal us, to be our savior. We have a need for this. And we could easily confuse the religion with the relationship. You know, the religion of the Sabbath is what we have to adhere to, to please God, whereas Sabbath is more for our benefit than God's need. Now, God doesn't have a need for the Sabbath, but he rests for our benefit, for our pattern, to give an example to us as a gift to us. And this is a difference then, because so all, so much of ancient religion, and even to this day, we think of, we've got to please God, we've got to give this to God, Whereas God is saying, no, what I really need from you is to receive what I'm giving, you know, and um, that's a lot of times we don't want to receive it gracefully. We want to receive it more as obligation because if I can check all the blocks and do everything right, then, then I, then I feel like I'm getting, it. and that's what Jesus is saying. No, 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 no. It's not, it's not about that. You, you misunderstand it. You know, when you're criticizing me for my disciples, um, think of the Sabbath as a gift. So, you know, he's not saying to desecrate the Sabbath, but he's saying that the spirit of it is most important and the reverence doesn't just occur, you know, in the, in the, in the temple, but it can also occur when you're meeting people's physical needs by feeding them just as much as it can meeting their spiritual needs. So it's a balance between meeting physical needs and spiritual needs when it comes to matters of, of faith, you know. Um, but I think we take it for granted because in the modern church, we get it. We're willing to do food pantries, to do, you know, Friday food delivery and things like that. But in many instances, there are places of worship who don't get that and think, well, it's only something that's happening in the sanctuary. And it's not. Well, I'd like to close in prayer. And uh, I do apologize to those online. I'll work on the camera and the microphone for next time and uh let's be in prayer for uh Eckhart's for the loss of their dog and um i'll go ahead and actually end this so i want to say bye to our online folks and we're gonna we'll lift up a prayer for you linda um and then uh i'll talk with you all later god bless